tell me a little bit about yourself and your background in IoT. So I'm uh, the vice president of the Kenoma software team here at Marvell Semiconductor. Um, I'm sort of a programmer by day and a manager by night, or vice versa, either way. But uh, try to balance those okay. two, so I kind of still keep my hands in the in the code and kind of know what's going on. Um, I, I found my way into IoT through mobile. I uh, was doing mobile app development, and a lot of the kind of the same concerns of early mobile development in terms of constrained environments, right. you know, not altogether reliable networks, things like that. Um, were very similar problems to IoT. So as we merged Kenoma from a standalone company into Marvell Semiconductor, mm -hmm. um, IoT was sort of a natural transition for us. Now Kenoma, it has a bit of history. Obviously, it isn't. It hasn't been started specifically for IoT, but it sounds like there's there's similarities. Maybe give us a little bit of a background on on kind of where Kenoma has come from. Sure. You know, we uh, we started at the uh, very tail end of the internet bubble, mm -hmm. um, working on um, portable runtimes, port uh, ways to write software that's portable um, for embedded devices, which okay. is kind of what IoT is now sure. kind of become. And we worked very closely with Sony for about five or six years. Um, and that, that really helped to set up the requirements, you know, for what, what we would need in a platform, what kind of technology, um, and some of the really core decisions we made. Um, you know, one of the things we learned uh, from working with Sony is that there were all these different divisions. Mm. And the engineers from one division couldn't work with engineers or on projects from another division <laughs> okay. because their software stacks were different and everything, right. you know, the language was different, the right. tools were different, and so, it was like all these independent companies, but they they were they knew they needed to work more and more together. There were you know these initiatives to get their products to talk, yeah. and so we'll, part of our contribution to that was this idea of using JavaScript as the programming language everywhere. Um, at the time, it was it was a little bit radical, but it, it certainly become kind of a, almost accepted in the mainstream kind of idea today. Mm. And um, you know that really worked. We were able to take, for example, at that time, engineers who had been working on portable media products, um, you know, digital video players and um, drop them into the camera division, um, mm, and mm, they, were, mm. they were very effective. Um, we could take some of those same dis skills and apply it to the computer division, the people doing the VIO at the time. And so this idea of being nimble with software by having some commonality in the software stacks um, is really a core part of what we're doing, uh, have been doing with Kenoma since the very beginning. Okay, now Kenoma's an embedded chipset. Um, where do you see, uh, Peter, the business coming from, let's say in the next couple years for embedded chipsets like yours. Well, so Kenoma is really the the software that runs on the embedded chipset. It we don't is. we aren't you know Marvell our, our parent company here um, is makes the chipsets. Okay. So they make, you know, uh, mobile chips, um, IoT chips, okay. uh, the chip that goes in Google Chromecast. And the thing that we bring that's really unique kind of related to that that Sony start is our same application software runs across all of those. And so once you've learned how to develop software using Kenoma, using our scripts, mm, mm. Um, you're able to make something that works on a TV, or make something that works on mobile, make something that works in a printer, make something that works in a light bulb. Mm. And that is really powerful, and that, that's really important to our customers, because you know, every time, companies are doing more and more diverse products, and every time they start a new one, they don't want to have to learn something from scratch because the development cycles, which used to be you know five years for a product line, are now right. down to like six months. Right. And so th they just don't have that time. So the learning, um, being able to reuse the skills, in some cases being able to reuse the code, is is really significant benefit um, for people working in embedded. Yeah, and I think also um, the development environment. You know, mm -hmm. specifically, you want to have a familiar development environment, and also something you know that our that our audience or my audience talks about a lot is the support, mm -hmm. the programming support. What support are we going to have? Mm -hmm. And therefore, if you've got more of a broader, I suppose, if you have a broader mm -hmm. uh, platform, then you can bring more, you know, more support yeah. to bear. No, and support's a big deal. You know, one of the things that um, you, you've seen in the last few years and embedded really kind of come into play is uh, open source. Right, and you know, people are are really demanding open source for any software that they're going to commit to because mm. it's not, it's often not so much an issue of price, but it's just kind of insurance against you know what's going to happen a few years from now, yeah. or what if what if I need to make a change and you're right. busy, right? Right, um, and so you know, we we see support kind of in, in three layers. We have kind of open source where you can do it all yourself, you're, you're good. Mm -hmm. um, we have online support forums where we are available, my team, my engineers, hang out and can answer questions for people directly. And then for, you know, for kind of um, 
customers who are, are um, engaged in a commercial relationship with Marvell will work very directly with them, mm -hmm. um, sometimes helping them to build out the architecture or optimize their code and things like that. So, you know, different levels, but it uh, depends on where a customer is at. Yeah, and I think, you know, something, you know, in just independent of, of whatever your company you work with, um, you know, we're starting to see brick devices, you know, where mm -hmm. the company is no longer in existence. Maybe they're not even not listening to you, but they're, they're not even there to listen to you anymore. Yeah. So that does, that does actually um, bring up the point of focusing on software rather than hardware. Mm -hmm. However, saying that, I mean, if you are focusing, if you're using a particular development environment, I suppose there's not that much flexibility in moving it to, different, uh, to a different hardware partner, for example, is mm -hmm. there? Well, I mean, that's part of what we're, we're really trying to change. You know, the, one of the reasons we chose JavaScript as a language to base everything mm. on is it was never tied to any particular operating system or any chipset, so it's intrinsically portable. Mm -hmm. And by open sourcing our software, you know, we already have it running on probably a dozen different operating systems over the history of the, of, of the company. Um, people can take it to other silicon. And, and you know, little by little we're seeing that. People are, are taking our open source software and bringing it up in different places. And I think um, over the next year we'll, we'll start to see some, some significant deployments that aren't just on, on our silicon. And you know, it's some work to do that, but it, it gives people a lot of flexibility um, to go where the cost structure is right, where strategically makes sense for them. Well, there's also a risk management issue. Yeah, right? absolutely. Well, let's talk, let's talk a little bit about uh, developing for constrained devices. Mm -hmm. In particular, what I'd like to know is, wh where are the biggest challenges or where are the biggest costs when you are developing for a constrained device? Well, the biggest cost tends to be the, the thing that you didn't plan for. <laughs> you know, so it's, okay. um, I mean, people spend a lot of time trying to optimize the hardware cost. You know, right. say, oh, we, you know, we're going to save 50 cents on this chip, right. or we're going to save a nickel on, you know, this sensor. And, um, you know, and, and when you get to a certain volume, that really matters. But for it? most IoT devices, it's, you know, it's thousands of devices or tens of thousands, and the place where all your money goes is your R&D costs, your software development costs. Right. And so, you know, I, um, I always kind of advise people to do the hardest part first, you know. And for different companies, that's different things. Some people, your product lives or dies based on its battery life. You know, so okay, don't make everything work. First, just figure out if you can have this thing on mm. and doing kind of like what it, you know, the very basics mm. it needs to for however long that is, right? For some people, it's performance, right? If this thing doesn't, you know, respond in a half a millisecond, you know, in a half a second, right. it's a fail. Right. Okay, well, can you do that? Because right. who cares about the rest? Right. For some, it's memory. You know, we have a million and one features, and we're just not sure we can pack them all in. And so getting that sorted out really early will tend to minimize the R&D surprises down okay. the road. Okay. Um, and it, it's never the same. You know, for some people, it's, it's network challenges. You know, you've, you've got to work in these very unreliable network environments. Sure. Um, how do you make that work? And, and so, you know, part of it is working with a, a platform where you can kind of see your way through to solutions to that. Part of it is having tools, right? If memory is the issue, can you measure memory, right? Are there mm. tools available mm. that will show you your memory use clearly mm. just so you Good can point. know when you're making progress? Point, yeah. Because visibility is the first step to, to solving those problems. Right, right. No, that's a good point. Now, now switching, you know, being very specific to IoT, you know, obviously an important component of it is sensors. Mm -hmm. And w what I'm interested in is a big part, you know, of starting out a project, um, once you understand what data you need, is then figuring out, well, how am I going to capture that data? Mm -hmm. Some of it's going to be on the internet, you know, through microservices, but a lot of it's going to be through sensors. Mm -hmm. So when choosing sensors, Will they work with any embedded system or vice versa? What, what is, you know, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, there are two, um, when you're looking at kind of prototyping kits, um, there are two kind of schools of thought. One mm. is a very um, open school of thought, and that, that one is things like uh, Raspberry Pi is a good example. Sure. Um, you know, Kenoma Create and Kenoma Element, our products are both open in that respect, so we, we kind of give you the pins and you can connect what you want. Right. Um, that requires a little bit more knowledge. Um, but it gets you access to almost everything. You know, the flip side are there are um, devices that have a specific set of sensors for them. You know, the 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 most fun example is um, little bits, right? Because you can snap things together, right? right? right that's and right. I mean, literally, a child can do it, and and they can't hurt themselves. And right. it's great. You know, the pieces are you know twenty or thirty bucks a piece. But you know, if you're building one, it works well. Sure. I mean, it, it's a fun way to get started. There's things like Arduino that are kind of in between, which has some standard form factors that, like the shields that people typically use with Arduino, mm. um, that work great and are really easy to stack up. But 
um, again, they sort of limit you in terms of form factor and what's available compared okay. to more general, which Arduino can also support. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, my I mean, my advice to people is if if you're uncomfortable with hardware, something that that just snaps together as a way to learn. Hey, what are these things? What do they do? How do I connect them? It's great, but you right. know, as you're as you're getting to product development, you may try you know a half dozen different temperature sensors to get one that behaves the way you want. Yes, because sensors are not as kind of automatically simple working beasts as people imagine. And so having a platform um, that is open where you can just plug those things in is really critical to getting to the right selection of components for the final product. So I understand you know, from a prototyping point of view, uh, that makes sense. But at some point when you're going from your prototype um, to your you know, moving into your minimally viable product, mm -hmm. you need to be using something that's going to be commercially available, that's going to mm -hmm. be mass produced. So on those on on those boards, is it pretty much is it pretty much a given that any sensor will? I mean, it's just going to be generally a voltage or an amperage interface, I presume. Mm -hmm. Will all boards or all embedded chipsets um, be able to support pretty much anything, or it's what are you looking for? Yeah, it, it's never that easy. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I squared C is a, is a good, which is uh, what a lot of the sensors are, is a, is a good example of a, of a standard that's not quite standard. You know, right. and in our development, you know, we get as many I squared C devices as possible just to, to prove that they work, um, right. because you do run into to strange problems with with some of them occasionally. Analog devices tend to be a little bit more sensitive to voltage levels um, we've seen, so that that can be a challenge. So, it it's there's really you know. The theory is always these things should work together. The, the, the reality is that they don't always. You know, Raspberry Pi is a good example. It doesn't really have built-in PWMs, which you need for a certain class of problems, um, especially robotics. So if you're going to do things that involve a lot of control, mm -hmm. you would want um, to use a platform that has that. Um, something like a BeagleBone, for example, is really good for that. Um, we recently did some enhancements to our, our um, Kinoma Create to um, give much more control over PWMs. Mm. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, I mean, the, my real advice to people is not to just assume the data sheet is true, but to really right. get in and, and try right. it. Um, because you, you're you never going to know for certain until you actually put it together and put it through its paces and kind of the way that you expect to use it. Yeah, yeah. So if there's a prototyping environment that uses the same I guess the same uh, interfaces, hardware interfaces, mm -hmm. I mean, then that's probably a good place to start. And if mm -hmm. not, then after the prototyping stage, you're probably going to have to test it with a number of <laughs> with a number of different embedded systems. Yep. Yeah. 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 All right. Let's talk about costs now. Mm -hmm. um, put things in perspective for the for my audience in terms of what are we looking at in terms of costs now. Not with, not the sensors, obviously, sure. but just more the more the brains that are on the that are mm -hmm. in the things themselves. Sure, I mean it, it's there's a real range, and it depends on um, what you are looking for in terms of performance. You know, adding an Arduino to a product, you know, it's a dollar or two. It's great. Um, as you get into more and more performance, you can be up sure. into the ten and twenty dollar range, right? Mm -hmm. a, a Google um, Chromecast is a good example. It's a thirty five dollar product. Um, that's not a high margin business for Google. They're they're doing that um, to seed the market. Sure. Um, so you know you've got to kind of figure out what's important. I um, I like a lot. There's starting to be some all in one chips, which um, save some money, but also just save board space and engineering. So mm. you know the Marvell mm. part that we've been working a lot with recently mm. is um, the IoT product from Marvell. In fact, it's called the. Uh, MW302. I remember part numbers oh, now, yeah, very and good. it's uh, <laughs> very good. <laughs> you know, it's one. It's one chip, kind of the size of your fingernail, that has a 200 megahertz ARM processor in it, uh, Wi-Fi uh, built right. in, right. and um, and a half a megabyte of RAM, which turns out to be enough actually for a huge fraction of the products out there. Mm. So you basically bring your power supply, a crystal, and flash. Um, and you've got you know the ability to Wi-Fi enable any product. You know there's other people who do similar things, for example, with BLE. And I think these all-in-one things are great because it means that the the chip manufacturer has done the pre-integration for you. Right. It also is you know in general going to consume less power. It's going to consume less board space. You save the engineering effort of of wiring everything together. So I, I think you're going to see more and more of that. You know it's kind of the SOC. For mobile that had you know the GPU built in, sure. and GPU most of the time, but the networking is really a, a core part of it, and the memory, um, yeah. the memory is there, and that's kind of a traditional part of embedded as well. Yeah. So you know those things are by the time you get a board put together and everything you know tested and whatever are still in you know single digit dollars, you know, say less than five bucks, maybe substantially depending on exactly how you do it to mm -hmm. Wi-Fi enable a product. Um, and, and that's that's only going down. So I, I think it's it's very cool, and it's why IoT ends up being inevitable, right? If you look, 
a couple years out, two or three years out, and it costs two dollars to add Wi-Fi to your product, and that means it's remote control and reconfigurable and can connect all these things. You know, you're making a product that's a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars. It's going to start to become just something that you're always going to have. And oh, by the way, that can be the microcontroller for everything else you do in your product. You probably needed one anyway, and so. You know, IoT really just becomes a part of the woodwork. How we use it, right? What the scenarios are, how how we enable it in industry, how we enable cities, how we enable consumers, is still an open question, and we're really actively all exploring that. But but the price point, and the capabilities at that price point are are really phenomenal as you just look a little ways out. Yeah. All right, Peter. Well, where can um, my viewers find out more about you and? Sure. So uh, the Kinoma website is a great place to start, K-I-N-O-M-A dot com. Um, said we, uh, we really are big believers in open, open source, open cloud, open sensor. And so you can see all of that there. There's just tons of sample code, tons of documentation. And of course, it's open source, so all, almost all the source code is there as well, so people can go check it out. Um, to get in touch with me, Twitter is a great way to do that. Um, I, I'm sort of a... Uh, uh, so it's a quirky Twitter feed, but but aren't they all? Um, and that's just P Hoddy, P H O D D I E, uh, on on Twitter or um, the Kinoma Twitter feed, um, just K I N O M A again. So um, yeah, I mean check it out. There's a lot of interesting things there. You know we have stuff for people who just want to play. We have things that are as simple as Blockly, where you can use visual programming to wire together things. You know, um, and then most of it's in JavaScript. And then for you know the hardcore programmers, just, you know you can dive down into the the C code and pick it apart at that level. So there's, there's a lot to chew on no matter what level you're coming in at. Excellent. Well, I'll put the, I'll put the uh, URLs and the uh, show analysis notes. And, uh, thank you. Cool. Thank you.